Good morning, everyone. My name is Mira Sivalingam. I'm one of the first year retina fellows here at Will's Eye, um, and I have the pleasure of kicking off our retina imaging conference for this academic year. So our first case is a 58-year-old male who was referred to our clinic for vision loss in his right eye over six weeks. Dr. Shalai, would you mind kicking us off, walking us through this image? Definitely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a we have a pseudocolor white field fund fundus photo of the right eye 2020 vision. The media appears clear. The optic disc appears to have clear and distinct margins. The cup appears to be within normal limits. Our attention is drawn to a um, pigmented deep retinal or choroidal lesion, uh, infranasal to the disc, about one disc diameter in uh, width. It appears pretty flat. I don't see any associated subretinal fluid or vascular distortions over it and no orange pigment. It kind of has a benign appearance to it. Moving forward to the retinal vasculature, our attention is drawn to areas of what appear like either sclerotic vessels or some vascular sheathing, uh, kind of focally involved with some skip areas potentially in the superior retina here, supranasally. Um, maybe some areas here inferiorly and also in the inferior macula as well. There doesn't appear to be any vascular tortuosity per se. I don't really appreciate much in terms of retinal hemorrhages. Uh, in the far periphery, the retina kind of has a little bit of a mottled appearance and uh, some discoloration to it. No, no frank whitening, though, that I can appreciate. Are those arteries or veins? Uh, these seem to be predominantly arteries. Now, in, um, infrotemporally, when you were describing the modeling, do you have any comment on the vasculature in that area as well? Yeah, so it appears attenuated at least, but I don't really appreciate much in terms of vascular structures here, so maybe associated with some hypoperfusion as well. Excellent. We have the so similar imaging modality in the left eye 2020 vision. Here the media is clear, optic disc has a sharp margin to it. Um, vascular appears relatively normal in terms of course and caliber as far as we can see in the visualized periphery. I don't really see any changes similar to what we saw in the fellow eye. Uh, the macula has an overall normal appearance to it. Excellent, thank you. So we have fluorescein angiogram, early phase. We're at 19 seconds. The arterial are starting to fill um, pretty early on, but uh, we do see some avid evidence of non-perfusion here, at least temporally. So moving forward, we're at 24 seconds. There is some laminar flow starting to develop in the veins. We still have these areas of kind of non-perfusion here in the inferior macula temporally, as well as here, nasally, I don't see any perfusion here. And kind of those sclerotic appearing vessels also are non-perfused. Uh, moving forward, we're at full venous phase at this point. There are still some areas that where we have um, hypoperfusion, hypofluorescence, as well as in the temporal area where kind of Dr. Garg was commenting, there appears to be hypofluorescence corresponding to hypoperfusion uh, in this case. Uh, full venous phase in the left eye. Um, I don't really appreciate much changes in terms of difference in fluorescence. Uh, later stage in the right eye, uh, we're beginning to see some hyperfluorescence corresponding to the borders of the areas that we have the non-perfusion. In addition to those arteries that we felt were involved also have some hyperfluorescence to them. I would argue that some of the veins here may also have some evidence of hyperfluorescence to them as well, as well as we can see continuously this non-perfusion in this nasal artery here. What about the nerve? Yeah, there, there's a little hyperfluorescence there. I'm not sure if I would call that necessarily hot, but I guess relative to the fellow eye, it looks uh, a little more hyperfluorescent. So inferior uh, retina here is visualized. We kind of appreciate the areas of non-perfusion and kind of similar areas of what appears to be um, 
hyperfluorescence along the vasculature of both arteries and some sometimes veins. So we have a horizontal raster OCT, the central macula and the right eye. Um, in the infrared image, we kind of appreciate those uh, vascular changes that we noted in that inferior arterial in the macula. Uh, going to the OCT B scan itself, um, the vitreous is uh, optically clear. Um, the choroid has a normal thickness and appearance. Uh, regarding the retinal laminations, the outer retina appears to be uh, well preserved. I don't see much in terms of changes there, but in the inner retina, kind of see these focal areas of what appear to be inner retinal atrophy. The layers are kind of have a collapsed and ill-defined appearance to them, at least focally. This is a vertical cut through the macula, and it's kind of nice that we kind of see the differential and asymmetric involvement in the inferior versus the superior macula. So superior macula is much more well preserved in terms of retinal laminations. In the inferior retina, we can kind of see those uh, inner retinal changes that we were kind of seeing earlier on. And it does kind of correspond to this area that we see uh, the changes in the arterial. Um, horizontal raster, OCT, uh, left macula, uh, vitreous is optically clear, choroid has a normal thickness and appearance, retinal laminations uh, appear pretty normal don't see a lot of changes here. Uh, vertical cut, the same. Yeah, normal. Yeah. Abdi, if I can interrupt for one second. Great job, by the way, with all the descriptions here. Uh, on the previous OCT, what, what, what do those uh, areas of inner renal atrophy kind of signify to you? Uh, so they're kind of suggestive of kind of potentially an ischemic insult, potentially a microvascular ischemic insult. Um, like one would think of, you know, an old ham lesion, it's not a diagnosis, but um, if there was ischemia present there, down the line you would expect some retinal atrophy to develop in the inner retina. Yeah, that's great. I, I think that's exactly what it is. And there is a, a new paper that just came out in retina, I believe, des uh, describing old PAM lesions, a uh, paper from Russia, I believe, and uh, it looks exactly like this. Can you go back to the horizontal on this one? Yeah. Um, so you can see, too, that there is um, some nerve fiber layer there um, uh, nasally. And um, then it thins out substantially over here. Now go to the left. And here can see that it's just a little bit more be uh, better defined in the left eye over here than it was in the right. Yeah. So the nerve fiber layer is being affected as well. Absolutely. The posterior segment exam was also notable for trace to one plus anterior vitreous cell. So we have a 58-year-old Caucasian male who came in for blurred vision in his right eye. On further history taking, he reports he awoke with patentless vision loss six weeks ago. He noted a kind of a nasal curtain that has not worsened or improved since this initial episode. His past medical history is significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he is a smoker. So Dr. Shalai, given our um, imaging findings, what types of things are running through your head in terms of a differential diagnosis? Yeah, so we're kind of dealing with an acute unilateral um, occlusive retinal vasculopathy in the right eye. Kind of thinking about broad differentials, I would overall think about um, occlusive retinal vascular conditions. So it's just on one side, ipsilateral carotid disease, given the risk factors of the patient would come in mind, uh, less likely to be cardioembolic given the uh, monocular involvement. Um, I would also think of uh, some periocular uh, treatments that sometimes could cause unilateral involvement, such as filler injections. I would kind of inquire that in the history of the patient. Uh, in addition, some intraocular medications sometimes could cause um, vasculopathy like that. For instance, uh, brolicizumab or uh, intracameral vancomycin, though we don't have quite the hemorrhagic appearance there. Um, when I'm thinking about kind of multiple arterial involvement, especially in the context of 
uh, branch retinal arterial involvement. I would think about something like Sussex disease. I would inquire about neurologic symptoms, kind of any hearing deficits or ringing in the ears, and work that up with MRI and MRA. Um, GCA would kind of be lower on my differential given that we don't quite see the pallid disc edema and uh, kind of a central retinal artery involvement. It's more branched arteries. Yeah. Um, also in terms of uh, inflammatory causes, uh, kind of predominantly involving the arteries, um, Bichette's disease um, comes to mind. It can involve both arteries and veins. Um, sarcoid is always in the differential though, predominantly affects the veins. And uh, things like uh, lupus or uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome uh, are also in the differential for inflammatory. Um, infectious ideologies uh, I would think about. So a viral retinitis can cause uh, vasculopathy like this, though we don't really appreciate much in terms of retinitis or hemorrhage itself, though I would kind of have that in my mind if the patient were to progress. I would definitely um, work the patient up for um, herpes virus, herpes simplex, her uh, varicella zoster, and CMV. Um, syphilis is kind of always in the differential. I would do a workup for that, uh, as well as TB. Um, and other rare conditions, um, you know, Eels disease, or um, it's kind of rare given that the patient doesn't have CNV formation. Um, Epton, when you say work the patient up for viral diseases, what would you consider? Yeah, so if I had a high degree of suspicion, um, probably I would uh, do an AC tap for this patient. And uh, look for PCR, for HSV, VZV, and CMV. JP, with, uh, with the symptoms being six weeks, is it consistent with viral retinitis, what you see there, with cells in the AC? Uh, no, it's not. Um, you, you would expect anterior chamber cells. You'd expect more vitreous cells. And, and first and foremost, you'd see retinal lesions, which we, which we don't see. So I think you can just, on clinical grounds, rule that out. I think you have to emphasize the fact that there's vitritis in there, which is, unless you're postulating two diseases, the vitritis rules out a lot of those things that you might otherwise think. The unilateral involvement helps to rule out some other things like bechettes. Um, so you have to consider the whole, the whole thing. For example, you wouldn't get vitritis in SUSACs. You wouldn't get it in APA syndrome. Um, Yep. So, Dr. Shalai, you kind of hit on all, all the big ones that are on our differential. Certainly with multiple branch artery occlusions, SUSAC syndrome was higher in our differential, um, but the patient didn't have his, his review of systems for any neurologic symptoms or hearing loss was negative. Um, so we did send the patient for a further medical workup with his PCB and hematology. Um, so he received an MRI, MRA of the brain with without contrast, which was normal. Carotid imaging was also within normal limits. We did get some labs, syphilis, quant gold, ANCA, ANA, RF, CBC, and CMP were within normal limits. His lab workup was significantly positive for beta-2 glycoprotein 1 and cardiolipin IgM positive. So the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome was made. Um, back to Dr. Dunn's point, when he did come back for follow-up, it was noted that the vitreous cell was very minimal. Um, there wasn't any, there wasn't much significant vitreous inflammation on his follow-up. Um, so antiphospholipid syndrome, it's an autoimmune disorder characterized by positive antiphospholipid antibodies. And these antibodies are thought to stimulate pro-inflammatory pro cytokines such as IL-1B, IL-6, and IL-8. And this is thought to stimulate endothelial cells as well as tissue factor to initiate the ca uh, coagulation cascade. When beta-2 glycoprotein is involved, it can interact with lipoproteins, which can cause atherosclerosis in addition to venous and arterial thrombosis. So here's our diagnostic criteria for diagnosing antiphospholipid syndrome. We have our laboratory criteria, which is either a positive lupus anticoagulant antibody, an anticardiolipin antibody, or an anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody in the setting of either an arterial or venous thrombosis or any small vessel thrombosis, all confirmed by imaging. Uh, 
or pregnancy-related morbidity, which could be an unexplained miscarriage, greater than 10 weeks gestation, pre a premature birth before 34 weeks, or more than three consecutive unexplained miscarriages, less than 10 weeks of gestation. Systemic manifestations are widely varying, ranging from cerebral ischemia and migraines to myocardial infarctions, gut ischemia, dermatologic manifestations such as skin ulcers or levator reticularis, which is kind of this blotchy um, red discoloration um, on the surface of the skin, thrombocytopenia, recurrent spontaneous abortions, as we mentioned before, and bone necrosis. Ophthalmic manifestations um, are also widely varying. You can kind of get these episodes of transient diplopia and transient field loss, and that's thought to be related to kind of intermittent ischemia, amaurosis type symptoms as well. You can have conjunctival and corneal manifestations such as aneurysms and telangiectasias of the conjunctival vessels, limbal keratitis, vitreous hemorrhage. You can also see disc edemia. And in terms of the retina, you can see arterial and, and venous occlusion, venous tortuosity and aneurysms, cotton wool spots, vasculitis and vascular sheathing, as well as acute retinal necrosis, so that's less likely. So management for these patients, the mainstay management is anticoagulation, typically with warfarin, um, and this is typically managed uh, by the hematologists. And in their guidelines, people with a venous thrombotic event, their INR goal is ranging from two to three, whereas if you suffer from an arterial or recurrent venous episodes, your INR goal is above three. There have been some reports of starting to look at immune modulatory, modulatory therapy, such as rituximab, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, IVIG, or plasmapheresis, but there's no um, solid guidelines, and those, are, those therapies are all under investigation currently. And most importantly, something that we can kind of be involved with a little bit in counseling the patient is reducing modifiable risk factors for the patient, such as managing their diabetes, hypertension, smoking, and um, OCPs. When you sent the patient to the family doctor, did you say which labs you wanted? Is that the way you worked it out? Yeah, so we gave a recommendation in terms of labs that we wanted, um, and then they kind of did a little bit more extensive hypercoagulable workup. But that's typically how uh, it goes. Kind of we make their recommendations, and they kind of expand based on um, their differential. Um, in terms of imaging, we did, you know, outline that we wanted an MRI, uh, brain, and carotid imaging as well. So the patient, interestingly, came back for his eight-month follow-up. Um, Dr. Shalai, do you notice anything in this photo here? Yeah, so now the left eye is 2040, and then we see some changes here, notably uh, disc hemorrhage or a splinter hemorrhage over here, and possibly some uh, arterial involvement in the supratemporal. Arcade. Yeah. So we ended up, he was lost a follow up from his um, hematologist. So we ended up referring him back there for further uh, management and INR management as well. So moving on to our second case, we have a 58 year old male who was referred for blurred vision in his left eye for two weeks. Dr. Light, would you mind walking us through this imaging? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, so here we have a wide field pseudocolor image of the right eye. Vision is 2025. The media appears uh, clear. The disc has good sharp margins, no edema, uh, relatively normal appearing cup to disc ratio. The vasculature uh, appears normal in its course and caliber uh, out to the visualized periphery. The macula itself looks uh, unremarkable, no lesions, no hemorrhages, and the periphery itself also looks uh, relatively normal. Excellent. However, in the left eye, uh, notably vision is 2050. Uh, again, the media appears clear. The disc itself has relatively sharp margins. However, uh, the eye is drawn to extensive peripapillary, what appear to be uh, cotton wool spots or retinal nerve fiber layer uh, infarcts. There's maybe also some maybe deeper layer, maybe some retinal whitening as well uh, in the macula. I don't see any prominent uh, retinal hemorrhages. The vessels themselves uh, show a little bit more tortuosity on this side uh, than on the contralateral eye. Uh, 
The periphery itself looks relatively normal where visualized. Uh, again, no hemorrhages or lesions. And aside from the uh, areas of some retinal whitening here, the fovea itself looks uh, uninvolved, at least on color imaging here. This and is just a more zoomed in Giving us image. a little better uh, look yeah. at these areas. Again, this maybe retinal whitening here as opposed to these more superficial areas of, of cotton wool spots that are seen in the peripapillary area. And there's also maybe some subtle macular striae here. So you use the term peripapillary, and peripapillary is correct. The cotton wool spots are close to the disc. You could also use the term juxtapapillary. Um, but in this, in this case, it's circumpapillary, completely surrounding the disc. So peripapillary is correct, but circumpapillary may be more descriptive. More descriptive, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so here we have, uh, this is wide field fundus autofluorescence imaging of the left eye. And the overall fundus autofluorescence pattern looks relatively normal, though I'll point out that there is some hypo autofluorescence in these areas. I'll call it peripapillary here since I don't see them go all the way around, uh, but kind of corresponding to some of the areas of cotton wool spot changes that we saw in the, in the pseudo color images. And here we have a uh, uh, fluorescein uh, angiography study uh, of the right eye. Uh, at 35 seconds, we can see we're in the laminar venous phase here. I don't see any disc edema. It looks like there's relatively normal uh, arterial and venous filling uh, for, this, for this phase uh, in, the, in the right eye. And unfortunately, they transited the wrong eye, so that's, that's why we don't have any earlier frames. Go ahead. In the uh, left eye, uh, however, uh, again, we are now in, it appears, full venous uh, phase. You can, again, see some of the tortuosity in the vessels I had pointed out earlier. Again, no frank disc edema uh, that I would call here, nor is there any early uh, macular edema. However, it does appear that temporally there may be some areas of kind of uh, pruned vessels, some non-perfusion in the far temporal area. And then there are these early patches of some hyperfluorescence uh, uh, at the borders, maybe early leakage, though I'd want to see a late frame to see if that persists. Jacob, can you describe the peripapillary lesions? Usually with cotton wool spots, it's relative hypofluorescence, correct? On, on, on the fluorescence. angiography? Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so there, yeah, it looks like maybe there's a little bit of that right here. Yeah. Um, I think there, there actually may be a little hemorrhage here that wasn't seen on the pseudo color images. Yeah. And then uh, it appears that in the right eye at a minute 25, so kind of a mid, mid uh, phase here, uh, again, full venous, uh, the perfusion itself looks Fairly good, though. Again, there's probably there's looks like there's some non-perfusion out here temporally, and again, this uh, hyperfluorescence at the borders uh, temporally as well. And this is a horizontal raster scan OCT uh, through the left eye, uh, going through both the nerve as well as the fovea. On the infrared uh, on FOSS images, you can see there's these uh, kind of irregular uh, pattern here in the area uh, around the nerve. And turning to the actual OCT uh, scan itself, uh, there's inner retinal uh, hyperreflectivity uh, here in kind of this dual laminar pattern, pretty consistent with uh, PAM-like lesion. There is a little bit of some irregularity of the inner retinal surface, possibly an ERM here. Uh, and then there's some irregularity as well in the retinal nerve fiber layer here with maybe some thinning and a little bit of, maybe these are some of the striae that we were seeing before, but there's relatively well-preserved outer retinal lamination pattern, uh, and it looks like the choroid is overall uh, of normal thickness. We just have some additional cuts here. Yeah, so here we can see, um, you know, marked maybe thickening here of the uh, nerve fiber layer with the irregular uh, inner surface might be consistent with cytoid bodies that are seen with retinal nerve fiber layer uh, infarcts. And again, this kind of PAM pattern of ischemia is seen as well. We have uh, in the right eye, again, this is a macular horizontal raster, uh, part of the volume scan here. Uh, interestingly, you can see the uh, premacular bursa here nicely with the uh, posterior hyaloid.
Uh, the retinal lamination patterns, at least nasally, look actually quite normal. Uh, there's interestingly temporally uh, kind of loss of the ONL, OPL uh, area. There might be some schesis change uh, out here. So given our imaging findings and our history, what types of things are running through your mind in terms of the differential for this patient? Sure. So we have a patient with uh, 2050 vision, unilateral, uh, with a unilateral presentation of circumpapillary uh, cotton wool spots without predominant hemorrhages. Uh, I would think uh, of certain entities such as perchers, especially if the patient had a history of trauma. If no history of trauma, then I'd be thinking perchers like, uh, whether this be in the context of GI disease or renal disease, or there's a whole other set of uh, etiologies that can lead to a perchers-like sort of picture. Um, I would also be concerned about some sort of a, you know, vascular, a vasculopathy, whether it be a retinal vein occlusion, though again, a little atypical without the disc swelling and without uh, prominent intraretinal hemorrhages. Could also consider uh, arterial occlusion, given the some areas of retinal whitening, though it doesn't have a classic CRAO uh, appearance, and the FA didn't really show marked uh, arterial uh, hypoperfusion or, or delay uh, in perfusion. Um, other things that can cause, you know, cotton wool spots, um, you know, HIV retinopathy. You can see that, though I would might expect that to be uh, bilateral. Um, other uh, hematological disorders such as um, you know, anemia, thrombocytopenia, though I don't see any of the uh, you know, Roth spots or, or retinal hemorrhages with white centers. Uh, and then radiation retinopathy, I think, would be another thing that I would consider with, uh, with uh, extensive cotton wool spots. So I'd want to know if there was a history uh, of that. Yeah, importantly, with radiation papillopathy, sometimes the first manifestation is circumpapillary cotton wool spots before the disc is swollen. About inflammatory like lupus. So I think lupus, you could consider that as well. Sure, absolutely. Excellent. So you pretty much hit on all of our main uh, differentials. Perchers or perchers like was kind of at the top given um, the pattern that we saw hypertensive retinopathy, HIV, lupus, anemia, hyperviscosity syndrome, radiation retinopathy, and some type of retinal artery or venous occlusion. So we have a patient, we further questioned him. He noted a symptomatic decrease in his left eye, vision in his left eye two weeks ago. He did note a history of hypertension, papillary renal cell carcinoma, status post nephrectomy. He also had a bout of diverticulitis about uh, five years back, status post partial colectomy. He denied any recent history of trauma. We did get some labs. Um, and checked his blood pressure while he was in the office. His blood pressure was within normal limits. Um, RPR, ACE, Lyme, TB, pretty much everything was normal. He did have a mildly elevated CRP, but as we know, this is pretty nonspecific in the absence of anything else. On further questioning, um, the patient finally reported that he had a recent inpatient admission two weeks ago for a severe colonic ileus with a partial small bowel obstruction. Um, and digging through the lab work there, amylase, CBC, and CMP were normal. However, he did have an elevated lipase and was treated for acute pancreatitis and that admission. So the diagnosis of Percher's-like retinopathy was made. So Percher's retinopathy was first named by Otmar Percher in 1910 in a patient who fell from a tree and suffered severe head injury. Visual symptoms and exam findings usually show up within 24 to 48 hours of the inciting insult. And it's characterized um, in the fundus exam by cotton wool spots, retinal hemorrhages, and percher flecken, which we will explain um, in the next slide. On OCT, in the early phase, um, as we saw in our patient, you can have interretinal hyperreflectivity and thickening, as well as scattered PAM lesions. And then the later phase, after the, further after the insult, you can have retinal thinning and photoreceptor loss. On Humphrey visual field testing, these patients can have central or paracentral or arcuate scotomas. And the FA can show a widely varying um, uh, findings, macular ischemia, focal arterial occlusion, perivascular staining or leakage, depending on when you're imaging the patient relative to the initial insult. 
So here's an example of Percherflecken. So Percherflecken are areas of kind of inner retinal whitening next to retinal arterial. And notably, you'll see this kind of clear space. And this um, corresponds to the capillary free zone, which measures out to about 50 microns on either side um, of that arterial. So we can divide Percher's retinopathy, like Dr. Light said, into Percher's or Percher's like. Classic Percher's is, is when you have a traumatic insult, such as a head trauma, chest compression, a long bone injury. There have been case reports um, associated with heavy weight lifting, um, battered baby syndrome, and barrow trauma. And Percher's like um, is considered in non traumatic cases, most notably pancreatitis or pancreatic adenocarcinoma chronic renal failure, connective tissue disorders, cryoglobulinemia, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, there have been some case reports associated with um, different orbital injections and retrobulbar anesthesia, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, preeclampsia, and certain cases of lymphoma. The pathogenesis is thought to be related to microembolization of the retinal vasculature, resulting in arterial pre-capillary occlusion and microvascular infarct of the nerve fiber layer. Some of these cases are thought to be, C, be involved in C5-mediated leukoembolization, where you get kind of mobilization of leukocytes and granulocytes, which causes endothelial damage to the small arterioles. Cases of trauma and um, associated with birth um, can be associated with fat or air embolization. So what's the management for these patients? It's typically medical management of the exciting event and medical optimization. There have been a few case reports um, where high-dose corticosteroids were used, um, and this is thought to be in, to inhibit granulocyte aggregation and complement active, activation. Wang et al. Um, reported this case report back in the 90s, a patient with traumatic Percher's retinopathy was treated with high-dose IV methylprednisolone, 250 milligrams Q6 for three days, um, and they were noted to have complete visual recovery. So this is just one case report, and it's definitely not the standard of care. So the patient came back for a two-day follow-up um, and was noted to have um, this small retinal hemorrhage here, overall stable, um, appearance of the cotton wool spots, no progression of the macular edema. Um, so the patient was referred back to his primary care doctor um, for further uh, medical optimization. So our last case is a 48-year-old female who was referred for one month of central vision loss in her left eye. So we have a pseudocolor white field from this photo of the right eye. Visual acuity is 2025. <laughs> Uh, media appears clear. The optic disc has uh, sharp margins, maybe slightly tilted. There's some evidence of some peripapillary at atrophy temporal crescent here. The vessels have a normal course and caliber extending to the visualized periphery. Uh, overall, the fundus has a little bit of a tessellated appearance to it, and there appears to be some uh, peripheral, temporal peripheral areas of possibly lattice degeneration. So same imaging modality in the left eye, 2040 vision. This is the eye that the patient symptomatic in. Um, media is clear. Disc also has a tilted appearance to it here. The margins appear sharp and distinct. Uh, also some peripapillary atrophy noted here as well. Vasculature has normal course and caliber extending to the visualized periphery. Also the peripheral changes uh, corresponding to lattice degeneration temporally here. And when we kind of draw our attention to the macula, um, zoomed in image there, we kind of see this kind of dark, uh, pigmented, maybe dark red, what appears to be deep lesion corresponding to the area of the anatomic fovea. It's hard to really appreciate any obvious subretinal um, fluid there. Yep, and it doesn't really come out because the image is a little dark, but on exam, it was just noted to be a hemorrhage with hemorrhage. some kind of associated pigmentary changes. So we have a horizontal raster uh, OCT through the right macula. Uh, infrared image kind of demonstrates that peripapillary atrophy that we were seeing in the color fundus photos. On the B scan itself, the vitreous is optically clear. The hyaloid seems to be attached. The choroid has a somewhat thin appearance, at least nasally. Um, and the retinal laminations appear uh, intact. 
Similar imaging modality in the left eye, um, we have kind of a central horizontal cut through the macula, 2040 vision, vitreous appears normal, choroid also appears thin, kind of in line with the um, myopic changes that we're seeing in this patient. Uh, the inner retina laminations appear intact. In the outer retina, we can kind of appreciate some thickening here in the what appears to be the inner digitation zone. The ellipsoid zone overlying it appears intact, as well as the external limiting membrane. Kind of going more inferiorly, we can kind of see that area through that uh, lesion that we were appreciating on the color photo, so which appears to be hyper-reflective along the um, at the RPE level, and there seems to be some associated subretinal fluid with it. There's no intraretinal fluid, and again, some thickening of the inner digitation zone surrounding it. Another cut more inferiorly, kind of similar appearance, little subretinal fluid here in the hyperreflective changes at the level of the RPE. We have a fluorescein angiogram in the laminar phase, 24 seconds in the left eye. Um, our attention is drawn to areas of hyperreflectivity in the central macula, as well as what appears to be hypofluorescence uh, corresponding to uh, the lesion we were noting uh, on the physical exam. A little late, later frame, we're at full venous phase at this point. Again, we appreciate the hyperfluorescence. Um, there appears to be kind of a stippled appearance to it, some areas more hyperfluorescent rather than others, especially at the border of um, that lesion that we were noting. So we have an, uh, uh, full venous phase in the right eye. Um, everything appears normal. A later frame in the left eye, kind of re-demonstrating that kind of stippled appearance. And at three minutes, um, again, we have hyperfluorescence it doesn't look like overt leakage, though there are some focal areas that are more hyperfluorescent than others. So we have a 41-year-old uh, Caucasian female who is referred for central vision loss. What types of things are running through your head in terms of the differential? Yeah, so the, the clinical appearance of it and um, the changes that we were seeing on the clinical exam looked like myopic changes, so I would clinically be suspicious for something like a fuchs spot in the context of uh, CNVM um, uh, related to the myopia. Um, in addition, other causes of CNVM would also be on the differential, things uh, like trauma, choroidal rupture, kind of see some of it here. Um, another thing I would consider is any laser-induced damage, um, laser retinopathy, um, in addition to things like CSR, mostly chronic CSR would, would cause, uh, could cause a picture like this, uh, though the choroid isn't thickened per se. Um, in addition, um, retinal dystrophies, um, vitelliform lesions, best disease, Stargardt's, it's kind of very asymmetric in appearance, but that would also be in my differential for this patient. So it, in terms of central vision loss in this age group, I think CSR should be on there based on the clinical appearance with the hemorrhage. Um, without with, without C CNVM, CSR should not be on there. So in further questioning, the patient noted one month of this progression, progressive vision loss in her left eye. She denies any past medical history, denies any trauma, no family history. She's on no medications, but a past ocular history was notable for a spherical equivalent of minus 6.5 in both eyes. So diagnosis of myopic unilateral CNV was made so in terms of management for this patient, she was initiated on Avastin therapy, Q4 weeks. And you can see, you know, the, the appearance of the lesion on OCT appears relatively stable. You know, we start out with minimal kind of subretinal fluid around the lesion. However, we do note that she has significant visual improvement. We don't have fundus, um, fundus photos kind of representing what we saw, but you can, on the exam, we did see resolution of that hemorrhage. So CNV in younger patients under the age of 50 who do not have any uh, drusen or pigmentary changes are usually secondary manifestation of other conditions. You can see it in inflammatory retinochoroidopathies. 
um, such as serpiginous and sarcoid retinal choroiditis, choroidal ruptured or angioid streaks, um, different inherited retinal diseases such as Stargardt's, although in our patient this is unilateral, so unlikely, um, different choroidal tumors um, or optic nerve drusen can cause CNV as well. So myopic CNV, high myopia is considered an axial length of 26.5 millimeters or more or sphere spherical equivalent of minus six. Pathologic myopia is considered an axial length of 32.5 or more or sphere spherical equivalent of minus eight diopters or more. It's thought that 10% of patients with pathologic myopia can develop a CNV. When you have a CNV in one eye, um, there's a 30% chance that these patients will develop a CNV in the fellow eye. Females are twice as likely than men to develop this. Um, and pathologic myopia is the second most common cause of CNV, second to AMD. And this is the Radiant study. This was a phase three, 12 month randomized double mass multi centered clinical trial looking at 20, 277 patients with visual impairment secondary to myopic CNV. And they were looking at the efficacy and safety of the use of ranibizumab versus vertigorphin PDT. And they did find superior improvement in best corrected visual acuity from baseline through three months and stability at visual, with visual acuity at 12 months. Also at 12 months, they found that 65.7% of patients did show resolution of their myopic CNV leakage on FA. Before you go um, any further, I mean, I think this story of that this patient probably needs to be discussed beyond uh, just the two injections that were done. Um, I would argue this, this case is probably, you're going to see this much more than the prior two cases. So I think it would be nice to hear from the audience, you know, how you manage it after. That's where I think some of the diagnostic dilemma comes in. Mm -hmm. Often, we, you know, we give one, two, three injections and sort of... Um, Hopefully, you, you, in the vast majority of cases, you get resolution. In my experience, that's not always the case. Um, and so uh, I, I, there's some debate in, among docs about how you treat it beyond, beyond that time point. And are you typically, I know when you see hemorrhage, you know, sometimes you're more inclined to treat. If you don't see a lot of subretinal fluid, what are you going off of? Are you going off of more of their visual acuity or the appearance um, on exam? So I think for me, the, the presence of a CNVM is paramount. That's number one. If somebody has an isolated hemorrhage without evidence of a CNVM, uh, I don't necessarily treat that. Uh, but if there's a CNVM, uh, I usually treat it. And there, you can make some analogies between this and what AMD. Um, and I'll treat it until the separate fluid is resolved and until the hemorrhage is resolved. Sometimes I'll get a follow-up uh, OCT, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, fluorescein intragram. If I'm at Wills, sometimes I'll get an OCTA to see what the CNVM is doing at that time, that's sometimes helpful. Uh, but I have some patients who uh, re require persistent treatment months and years after uh, the initial event. A lot of the times, they don't behave. I mean, yes, partly you can treat for months and years, but the recurrence rate is not as high as in AMD patients where it's widespread RP loss. So a significant number of these patients, you can go to maintenance therapy like every three to four months. It's not monthly, at least in my experience. Yeah, I, I agree. And in some of these patients, I may even do a PRN dosing. Like, I'll just do it as needed, uh, which is definitely not the case with wet AMD. Is that how you're typically starting to space them out, or do you do as treat and extend initially and then go to PRN, or is it case-to-case -case basis? Usually three in a row, and then we uh, treat and extend as time goes on. Especially in younger patients in the 40s and 50s, you can extend them out pretty pretty widely. Yeah, I would. Uh, I do treat and extend too. Um, I, I will treat until the hemorrhage and the subarachnoid fluid are gone, no matter how much it takes, and I will tell the patient that you know this is what we're looking for, uh, and then treat and extend. And, and my extension would probably be more aggressive than it would be for an AMD patient. Sometimes I'll do every Q2 weeks for one AMD. For if it goes away pretty quickly in, in this setting, I may even just extend them, you know, once a month. And once I get to three months, I don't, I don't treat them. But as needed dosing, I think is a is a better way to treat these patients, uh, especially when the recurrence rate is low, as Dr. Silvano mentioned. Can you go back to the OCT? Because mm -hmm. uh, I just have a question. Yeah, here 
is this real or is this artifactual? Is there a short posterior ciliary vessel here that's causing chronic trauma to Brooks membrane there and, and, and um, breaking it down or is this just purely artifact? I, I think it's uh, optical shadowing from the blood. Yeah. Okay. So I see in this image here, I would still treat that the Bana image. I mean, I see subdural fluid there, and I'm not sure if there's hemorrhage or not, but I would, even though we're at 2020, I, I would still treat that. There's still some subdural fluid. There's still some activity of that CNVM. And one interesting thing to show, although it's going to be hard to show it, but I would argue the recurrence rate of this coming back would be higher if you leave it like this versus if you treat it until it's totally dry. Excellent. Thank you. 